Good morning. Welcome to the first allocator governance call of April 2nd, 2024. Let's take a look at what we have on the agenda for the call. For this call, we've really focused the content to what issues are impacting allocators and going over that for the whole community's benefit. So that means we'll start off by taking a look at the data cap that's gone out, talk about ways to submit support issues to receive the fastest possible help from Fiddle, the governance, and the community. We'll check in on the weekly allocation schedules that's impacted some of the existing applications, and then wrap up new allocator issues with tooling updates from Fiddle on what to expect to come. After that, the majority of the call is focused on FAQs. So if you're an allocator and you're on the call, you've been using Slack and the allocator private channel and seeing a lot of the questions come up. We've collected those questions and put together a few slides to talk about each issue and go over it to make sure you have what you need. And then plenty of time at the end of the call for anything that you might want to talk about, flag, or address for the entire community. So with that, let's take a look. Today is April 2nd. The next call is scheduled to take place on 16 April. If you don't have it bookmarked already in the slide deck is the agenda that you could add to Google Calendar. And all of these slides are shared in the Phil Plus channel as well as the Allocator channel on Slack. For those allocators that are already seen, you got your first data cap. So congratulations, that went out about a week and a half ago. And if you want to view that data cap, there's the link to data cap stats there at the bottom. You can see how much was allocated to each allocator and then how much has been distributed right there on that link. Now, let's talk about some of the support ways that you can reach out to Fiddle and the governance team to make sure you have what you need. For most common support questions, there's two ways that you can submit those issues. Issue number one is in the Phil Plus Allocator Slack channel. This Slack channel is set up only for allocators and it's meant to serve as a working discussion board. We'll refrain from like public updates. That'll be great for the Phil Plus channel. And this keeps this channel for tactical things that you may need. So if there's any discussion on like, how do I do something? Where do I go? That Phil Plus Allocators channel is the perfect medium for you. We'd recommend to avoid DMs as much as possible and we'll talk about that more later on the call. The second support system that you have that we're going to talk about on this is the allocator registry. So here you can come and create a new issue. That issue will be tracked just like a bug. People can see it. We can come back to it at a later time. And we'll talk about the best ways to use these as we go through. So let's start with Slack. Slack is fabulous for rapid communication, as you've all seen. Most of our organizations are spread across the world, so time zones are always a concern. So if you ping a member directly in a DM, you might have to wait for that person to find the DM, find a solution and get back to you. So we'd highly recommend if there was a question or you encounter a roadblock, if you're an allocator, your first place to go would be to post a comment in the allocator channel. What's nice about this is the fiddle and governance team span the globe. So you might reach one of us during sleeping hours and waking hours. So you're gonna get a much faster response. The second is somebody in the community might be facing the same issue and not yet voiced it. So if we troubleshoot in a direct message, it kind of ends right there, as well as being a lot slower. So a great way to flag any issues that might come up is to start by making a comment right there in Slack. This reaches everybody, it's fast, and we can triage from there. The second way is if you have a more technical issue and you don't feel comfortable for any reason going to Slack or you're already in GitHub, there is the allocator registry. What's great about this is that it's able to provide a lot more detail where we can link back to the applications. If you're not comfortable with Slack and those communications, this is a great way to kind of flag those issues. So there's three, we've been closing those out as they go through and anything that might come up. Some of the common ones that we've seen is like, hey, I've changed my repo address or hey, my GitHub address has changed or hey, I wanna update my multi-sig. This is a great way to kick those issues off the Fiddle team sees this, the governance team sees this, and we can share this with third-party developers as well. So again, you have two ways to go about submitting those support things. As we start to roll these issues out more, you're going to start to see how we're updating these. And all of the information for the allocators lives in this JSON registry that was built out. If you've been around the program for a while, this is nothing new. This was a big focus of our work in Q2, Q3, and Q4 of last year. And what these JSON files do is essentially contain all the information for an organization. So if you look at the screenshot that I have here, you can see this allocator issue is 996. That was their application. And here is all the information, their GitHub, their links, their multi-sig address. 
So whenever an issue is filed, typically the governance steps, myself or Galen, we're going to come in here and edit this JSON file. So on this call and a little bit later, we'll be giving you guidance so you don't have to always wait for the governance team. This is helpful if you have a change to a multi-sig address or you have a new member of your organization that you wish to grant rights to your GitHub application. We'll slowly spell it out. And this is meant to be more of a self-help. If you're more of an advanced returning notary allocator and you'd like to do this yourself, we'll talk a lot about how these steps work. And then what we're working on right now is that when you go into GitHub and you file an issue right now, it's a blank template. One thing that's really great about the new updates that have been put in is tooling. So we're working on issues that are specific. So like, hey, I need a new GitHub address added to my organization, or hey, my repo is off, whatever the issue may be. When you come click new issues, you'll see a pre-populated template. And again, the goal is to make this simplified and user and remove any blocks that you have with allocations. So to recap, Slack, if you're messaging us in Slack, the best way to do it is avoid the DMs and use the allocator channel. There's a GitHub page in the allocator registry that's fabulous for submitting an issue. It's tracked, it's timestamped, and we can edit that. And if you're a little bit more tech savvy and you feel comfortable, you could submit a commit change on the actual repo for your JSON file, and that will automatically update that when we merge that file. up. So we're going to be releasing a lot of this information in the form of guides that you can see, and we'll cover some of those on this call. But again, it's meant to be a three-fold prong approach to getting you whatever you need as you start to allocate that data cap. So I'd like to hand the floor over and kind of give you an update from the Fiddle team on what they're working on as far as tooling. So Will, KZ? Hey everyone, um, happy to jump in here quick. This, uh, along with the, several of the GitHub links K-Ray just discussed, this this would be a, another one to keep on your short list. This is under the Fiddle Labs GitHub repository. We have what's called allocator tooling. And right now this is where we're keeping and tracking any sort of bot enhancements, iterations that we're making to the tools in GitHub. Because as most of you are, are familiar with now, as you're going through each step as an allocator, you know, there's little things that need to be tweaked and updated. So we're working on those diligently here. And you can see the list. If you if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to go in and see some of the details, you're, you're free to go in and look at that. I, I recommend if, if you have your, an issue of your own, like you already mentioned, go to the Slack channel Talk about what issue you're specifically having. So maybe we already have one of these issues logged and it's being worked on. So Will or I would probably know better. Uh, so I prefer you to go there. In terms of what's happening right now, what's coming up in the near future, uh, I I would say by the end of this week, I'll, I'll get out like a, maybe every Friday, we'll try to send out an, an update on what has changed or what's upcoming. Because there's a lot of things for the allocators to know in terms of you know how to do their job as an allocator and, and what tools are changing and what they need to understand that might have become a new enhancement. So um, we won't go through all the details just today, but Kay Ray, I'll, I'll commit to like by Friday, having a, an update in the allocator channel of some of the key updates, perhaps with a video if, if it's more detailed so that everyone can, can follow along um, there. The, the one that's listed on this page here that we can quickly talk through, this was an issue right away where allocators were looking to sign. So you would log into allocator.tech, plug in your ledger, and once you were looking to sign off on an allocation request, if it wasn't the first address in your wallet, it, it was an error. So if you're using the second address, third address, et cetera, it wasn't syncing properly. It wasn't allowing you to select which address you wanted to sign off with. That has been updated. So now when you log in, plug in your ledger, click sign, th there'll be a pop-up that'll show a list of addresses, normally five F1 addresses that you have on your ledger. So you can choose the one that you associated with signing as an allocator. Um, I know I, I had that issue. I, there was a few others who submitted this. Um, so now that should pop up when you go to sign. So if you still have issues with that, let us know. But that's the one that's been implemented um, most recently. We have a few more coming later this week. I believe the allocator.tech has also um, 
that interface has been updated to allow you to, um, at the review time, sign off on a different amount than what the client proposal has to make that flow easier. Uh, so, so if you've got a custom amount that you want to give out as your initial allocation that is not the standard weekly now, uh, allocation that gets automatically calculated, um, in case that's you know just a, a function of there being, for instance, um, a really large amount of uh, data cap overall or things of that nature that you need to start slower, um, you'll now have a box where you can uh, have set your policy of what you're actually giving out. Um, so that, that will continue to evolve. And we probably will have some documentation on Friday with some other uh, tips there. Yeah. I guess more generally that um, allocator tooling, which uh, several uh, of you have found, um, if you follow along on those issues, we'll, we're keeping a pretty good track. Those issues get closed out when things are deployed that fix them. Um, so that that's, you know, if you're, if you're paying it more close attention, you can do it by watching us uh, make progress and close those issues. Dalen, floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to check. I, there was an issue that came up last week. I wanted to make sure we talked about it. Um, and I, Will, I think you were just mentioning it. If a client requests an amount of data cap, claiming that they will use one PIB weekly, uh, that is what would show up in the front end app, even if that is not the correct allocation schedule for each allocator, right? So if a client says, oh, I will use five PIBs a week, uh, that is what would show up in the front end. And the allocator would need to manually override that client requested amount to match the allocator's schedule from their allocator application. And so now there was an issue with the tooling last week where that override was more difficult. And what it sounds like we're saying is that we have shipped an update to make that override easier, but the burden is still on the allocator to set the correct amount for the allocation that they want to send out. Is that correct? Great. And there was also a question that came up last week around first allocation versus allocators that, or versus clients, sorry. First allocation to a client um, from an allocator compared to a client who has been in the program for a while. For example, they've worked with the previous LDN process. Um, <clears throat> my interpretation of this is that if the client has worked with the LDN process, that is a different process. That was a different notary. That was a different diligence process. And that the allocator address is new. So if somebody applied to be an allocator and said, we will give out initial allocations of 50 TIBs, and a client shows up and says, well, I've been in the program for this long. I think you should give me one PIB, or I think you should give me 500 TIBs. That is still a new relationship between this allocator and this client, and they should be following their allocator application, which would be a 50 TIB initial tranche to that client. It is a new connection between this client and this specific allocator. So that's how I interpret that. Um, and that was the thing that came up last week. I think that this is a good example where that override of client requested amount should come into play. The burden should be on the allocators to review the application and make sure that it matches their stated tranche schedule. Um, Ian, did you have a hand on this topic or on a different topic? Uh, I On this topic. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure if anyone else wanted to discuss this one. So go for it. Um, yeah, so we said in our allocator applications that uh, new clients, we would give them an initial test amount to get started. And then future allocations would be based on historical usage to make sure that they can meet at least one month worth of their historical data onboarding rate. A lot of the projects we work with who have been in the LDN process are uploading large amounts of data over the course of a year or more. Um, is it's still okay for us to take into account the historical usage under the LDN program for deciding how much to allocate to them? Yes, because that is what was put in your application to be an allocator. 
So in your application on, I think it's like question number 30, when you say, we're going to get this much initially, our subsequent allocations will be based on historical monthly usage. We will use these sources for that historical usage. I think that is a reasonable expectation. The thing that we don't want to see is an allocator have what is a brand new client to them give out a massive tranche initially without some additional kind of checks. Right. So I guess my question is, since it, it also came up, I think last week or the week before, that we would have to create new wallet addresses for each of those clients because the uh, tooling would get confused if they reused a wallet address from the LDM process. So uh, can you, what, what's the right way for us to indicate that this new client wallet is actually the same as this old client wallet and therefore the historical usage should be based on that old wallet? Um, if you want the historical usage to be based on an old wallet and you want that to be kind of calculated in an automated way, that's going to be a harder relationship if you are if it's just sort of a like paper trail diligence i think that it is very reasonable to say we have this client who is you know social impact project partner a they have this new client address this new client address is brand new for this relationship to us and we gave them whatever 50 tibs of an initial allocation this client historically has used this other address and that is in sort of the client application right as like other associated addresses that they've used and you say we are referencing this historical activity from this address and that's just kind of captured in github as like a diligence paper trail um we could you know if this becomes a thing that we need to like build a bunch of tooling for right there could probably be ways to say, look at other associated addresses. And then you could say, send a message from one address to the other to confirm that those two people are um, associated together um, and not just, you know, a symbol or some, someone um, claiming to, to have access to an address that they don't. Uh, yeah, I don't think it necessarily needs to be an automated process. I just want to make sure we don't accidentally trip any automated like compliance checks, or if we do trip an automated compliance check, that we have the right documentation that we can manually verify we're doing the right thing. So thanks yeah, for that clarity. I think, I think similar to what Casey put in the chat, a, a GitHub paper trail that explains it for now is a, is a sufficient example where the client is both saying like, yes, this was our like previous activity. You're saying like, yes, this was our you know, previous activity. I think the schema for these, um, for the JSON machine readable uh, applications and sort of records uh, in that, in, in those record keeping per pathway repos, um, the schema does contain um, a place where you can talk about previous um, addresses that are associated with that client. Um, we're not using that currently on the tooling, but I can point to the schema for where you would document that if you do want to have that for once, you know, you know what that key is in the JSON that you would that you would use to, to sort of have that pointer. Mm -hmm. But right um, now that's going to look a whole lot like a GitHub paper trail. Yeah. Thank you. Cabrina put in the chat, have them apply under the same client address. And we don't want that. We don't want clients to be using the same address for multiple relationships with allocators um, and previous notaries. It makes automated tooling difficult. It makes things like data cap removal more complicated down the line. Um, there, there are client addresses are you know free to create um, essentially, and so keeping more clean relationships between this client address to this allocator. And if a, if a client is working with multiple allocators, this allows them to say with this other client address, I have this relationship to this allocator. My deal making is going to follow that allocators kind of standards. 
it gets really difficult if an allocate because two different allocators or an allocator and a previous LDN will have different, you know, diligence rules. For example, number of storage providers that they're working with. And if the bots are looking at one client address that has gotten data cap from the LDN, from a direct notary allocation, from an allocator, the bot is not going to be able to say, well, this data cap was used in this deal, which came from this notary address. Um, because the way that the chain handles it is data cap comes into the client and it's just first in, first out. It, we can't track the data cap on chain in a way that says, if I got five tranches of data cap from five different people, I could assign which place that came from. You do that using different client addresses. So in this, in this situation, we want people to use a unique client address for their allocator relationships. And if somebody has like a great idea of another way to structure this um, around like a FIP and say, we, we want to, I think this would be a pretty hefty protocol change to be able to track a client, a single client address and say, as it receives data cap, assign that data cap relationship to a particular notary address. And as it makes deals, allocate from that one client address bucket but say which associated allocator it's coming from. I think that would be possible. I think that that would be hefty. And I think they would add complications on sort of the deal proposal side of things. Um, it's not impossible, but it is not currently in uh, protocol scope. Okay, Ray, back to you. Nice. Well, my computer just froze, so I switched over to this one. Let's take a look over here. We have a couple of links that will help. So as Galen walks about like those questions that have come up, Will and Casey and Marta over at the Fiddle team have put together two great resources. Casey, Will, so I don't step on these great updates. Do you want to kind of cover what the community can see in these? Sure. Um, the first one actually Will created last week. Don't want to steal your thunder, Will. This was related to editing an application. If a client applies, what is the process to go in and edit any of the details? Because it is different than from the LDN days. You have to go into the pull request, not into the issue itself. So there's a step-by-step -step guide for that specific process. We'll talk about that in, in a few slides in a little bit more detail. And then the second link is more just a general FAQ that we've created for our team based on all the questions we've seen coming in. So it's always a good place to go if, you, if you're just getting started or you know have some general questions. I'd give that a, a read over, familiarize yourself with some of the, the processes. And I think we can look to continue updating that ongoing in an ongoing nature maybe. Um, that's just another another resource for you there. Yeah, props for putting these together. The the top one here, this modifying application, we'll talk about a lot of these steps on the call. And this is just such an easy to follow guide. And then the FAQ that KZ put together, again, a lot of those common issues that we see. So thanks again. So one of the things I wanted to flag too is one of the concerns that we get from people that are joining the Phil Plus program is, hey, there's a lot of information and how do I kind of sift through this and kind of get going? So in addition to those support links, in addition to Slack, one thing that we're looking at at the governance team is collecting some of these issues and then populating them. And the goal is that as somebody joins the Phil Plus community or as an existing allocator has issues, there's multiple places that you can go that contain these like troubleshooting steps. So if you see this screenshot here, one of the goals is that all of the issues that we've been collecting, you can view in GitHub. It's a great historical record. You can see where it was added, who commented. And one of the problems with Slack is after a message has been you know, communicated for weeks, it's very difficult to go back and find it. So we'll be working to put these in GitHub to make it a lot easier for you. 
So with that, we have a topic about the weekly data cap distribution. And this comes from what we've seen with some tranches going out. Galen, would you like to speak to this one? Otherwise, I'll just keep going. I'll, I'll completely leave it up to you. Um, you get started. I'll see if there's questions. That sounds great. All right. So here's what's going on with this. So essentially, if you're an allocator and you received your five petabytes and you've already started to receive an application, what you might have noticed is that if your pull request hadn't modified the weekly allocation and an applicant asked for a tranche, they would get the full amount rather than whatever your schedule that you set up. So this was flagged and KZ posted a really comprehensive post in the Slack channel, but just to kind of talk about it, all applications should receive data cap on the schedule that you outlined in your application, not all at once and not in one big thing. So that means that as you start to receive these application requests, you'll have to modify that pull request with the weekly schedule. Now, the good news is everything we're talking about right now is in process with the tooling. So hopefully the tooling is able to recognize this and correct this. But in the meantime, until we make that announcement, I want to make sure that all of the allocators are mindful of this, how to manually modify that pull request. So take a look at this screenshot that we have right now. In the top right is what you put in your application when you became a notary. This is question 30. And it's like, hey, what's my allocation tranche schedule? So if someone asks for, you know, 10 terabytes, how are you going to distribute that? Well, in the first week, you give 10%, then 20, whatever you spelled out, it should not be 100% in week one. And so this means that if you see an application where 100% of the data cap is going out in week one, you should flag that as a problem. And here's how you address that problem. If you take a look in the JSON file, there's a line called weekly allocation. And you see that bolded in red there at the bottom. You'll need to modify that pull request to follow whatever allocation schedule you set up. So if you said 10%, what is that 10%? What is that 20? Again, this is a manual step that you'll need to take on the pull request. If this is something where you do not feel comfortable modifying, or you don't want to get into this, feel free to post in Slack. Hey, my name's Kevin. I'm with this organization. Can somebody from the governance team please help me modify this so we can come through and help you take a look at this. Again, this is a stopgap until tooling comes in, but it's also very important because for auditing on these five petabytes, if all your distributions go out, they're unaudited and they all go in these single big tranches, it's really hard to justify that you're following the rules and sticking with your application. So this is really important if you're one of these impacted notaries or you're making that change as you go through. So with that, I'd like to pause and see if anybody has questions or Galen, Will, KZ, feel free to add any context you wanted to this. Yeah, uh, I want to jump in here and say like two other things. Thing number one, um, what we want to do, what we're sort of working towards <clears throat> is getting to where we can take all of these answers from like question number 30. And then when we move to rolling applications, make that question a little bit cleaner um, and sort of standardize those into that JSON file that we mentioned before, the JSON file that's in the allocator registry that has your uh, uh, like pathway information. So if we can get those into a clean, kind of consistent machine readable format, then the tooling that looks at that JSON file and says, I'm allocator number 1091, here's my allocator address, here's my GitHub repo link for bookkeeping, here's my GitHub name, and here's my allocation schedule, you know, X, Y, Z, that the tooling would then be able to read that and set those calculations. Then when a client applies, they can say what they want, but it would then automatically override to your allocation schedule. And it would say uh, the client applied for X amount per week and your allocation schedule is based on weekly usage. It would just populate that in. That's where we want to go. The problem is because these were free form text applications and we got, you know, 80 different people wrote it in 80 different ways. And so it's not machine readable. Um, and the calculations going from lesser of 10% or five pit, like it's, a, it's this like complicated, you know, high school math word problem um, that like when you read all 80 of them, you're like, wow, this is messy. So we're working on cleaning that up um, to make it standardized. One of the things that we wanted to do is have like a nice um, 
uh, GitHub issue template form, where similar to what we're going for, people being able to put in that issue template to more quickly change things like, I need to update my address, I need to add a Slack account, I need to update my tranche schedule, you know, if we can make that form work really cleanly um, to be in a, a standardized PR, we can merge those and we'll update that JSON as we go. So we want that. Um, the, um, oh, there's another thing that I want to say, and then I totally lost my train of thought. Um, shoot, Danny, come back to me. I, I've, I have three points to make, but I can't remember what they are. Uh, Okay, Ray, I'm going to give it back to you, and I'll just raise my hand if I remember what the other one was. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to adulthood. Hey, we got a question that came in from Ian in chat. It's directed to Will. Will, I'll read this out, and if you wouldn't mind kind of talking about this for the benefit of anyone watching. Sure. The question for Ian is, hey, is there a guide on how you're doing the tooling to build these repos? Because their allocation, they include the multi-sig in their application, but they haven't yet built their repo and they didn't know which Airtable form. So I think this is kind of like a general question. Yeah, specifically, if I manually create my GitHub repo, just how do I get the tooling into that repo? Is there a set of steps I need to follow somewhere? Cool, there are two things that need to happen. The first is that the repo needs to be understood as your official repo for the tooling to work against it. And the way that that happens is the JSON file that's in allocator registry that's signed off on by governance team has a bookkeeping repo field in that JSON for your allocation pathway that will point to the repo you create. Um, so you'll you'll have that link and there will be a PR and it will end up in that um, in that governance repo for the overall Phil Plus program. The second so yeah, so here's all of these JSON files as they exist, and, and there is a field in there um, that you'll see that is um, the allocation bookkeeping uh, field. And so that, that's where you'll um, paste and sort of have the overall things point to your repo. Um, the second thing that you'll need to do is give permission to the tooling to access your repo. Um, and we've shared this link a couple times, um, but we can we can share it again. Um, it is at um, github.com slash uh, apps uh, slash data cap dash bot. I can paste that in chat as well, but github.com slash apps slash data cap dash bot. And you'll install that and make sure it has permission to access the repo that you create. After you do that, Periodically, the app will look at the governance um, allocator registry. And when it sees itself, sees your repo added there, it will push the initial structure and the rest of the stuff will happen automatically. So the only two things you need to do is make sure this, that the data cap bot app has access to your repo and then have your repo listed as the allocator bookkeeping um, point of contact for you in that registry. So great answer, thank you. Um, it looks like Galen Galen linked to our JSON file, which has a a repo that was it looks like already created for us in the Phil Plus bookkeeping uh, GitHub org. Um, who do I talk to to make sure that our team has access to that repo so that we can start using it for? Um, I think Galen you know, notarizing things. Great. Yep. Then I'll coordinate um, with Galen if. if we <clears throat> we had that form open. If people did not uh, submit an answer, we went ahead and manually um, made the multi-sig and made the um, allocation bookkeeping repo link uh, just so that we weren't um, gated and waiting on people. We can change that bookkeeping repo uh, to a different one, or you can use that one, which um, is inside the uh, Filecoin um, organization. Uh, hey, hey, Kay Ray, if you would just pause here for one second. For, for everyone on the call and for those that watch the video later, when you're just getting started out as an allocator and you're, and you're getting ready to test how everything works, highly recommend you come to your JSON file here following this link. Go to the registry, you find your specific JSON, 
and you review that information that Kay Ray was highlighting. You review your, your GitHub usernames, you review the allocation bookkeeping link, you review multi-sig and assigners, because everything after that will not work if, if you're using different information than what's on this file. And the only way to change it is, I think Galen, you prefer them to open up an issue and say, hey, I need this changed. So Kay Ray, if you scroll up, click on issue, open a new issue, you can say, hey, Galen, we want to update our, our repo to this. And then that way he has a record, he can go in and, and manage it that way. Because um, a lot of the questions, when we go through the FAQs in a couple minutes, they all stem from that information not being updated. And if you don't know your number, so like, for example, 996, I know that that's my allocator. That's listed on the um, on the applications themselves. So if you remember when you apply to become an allocator in the notary folder. It's probably uh, easier to just use search in the repo for your name. So in that upper yeah, right where it says tap slash true. to search, if you can type in your, your organization name or your pathway name, you'll find the file that contains that information. It's true. But also if you wanna go reread the answers to the questions that you wrote for your application, you can go back to the notary governance folder, search for your name, search for your application number so that you can match the both. You should start to memorize that number. It's, it's important. Um, yeah. Great build on. Ian, is there anything else we can get you on this topic before we go on, bud? Nope, this is great, thanks. Hey, thank you. Sweet, well, some of the questions that have come up, we wanted to highlight them and just make sure that we kind of had a record. So Casey just kind of talked about this and to build off, here's issue number one. Hey, something's going wrong and I need help, please. We talked about Slack in the beginning of the call. Please, if you can avoid the DMs, they'll lead to a little bit of a longer response. Everyone can triage on the allocator Slack. But if you want to come through here into the allocator registry, you can make a new issue. Right now, it's just bare bones. Like I said earlier on the call, we're working on having specific templates that you can fill out. Add GitHub user, change multi-sig, change repo, X, Y, Z. So look for this. But if you want to submit an issue, it's the allocator registry. And we can see triage and go forward. Second question that we've got is like, hey, I'm brand new to the program. Did I get data cap? So if you haven't yet checked out some of the sites, this data cap stats is a great page. Come to this, you can see how much data cap was allocated, how much data cap is available. And what's nice is you can see this for other organizations besides yourself. And the third question was, hey, I'm allocator X, and I just wanna kind of see what allocators Y and Z are doing. So a great way to do that is if you go to the data cap stats page, you'll see that every notary or allocator has a specific ID. And if you're curious to see like what other chain has been going on with that ID, just copy it over to this site called Phil Fox, and we'll pin these here on the call. And then it will show you everything with that address for the overview. So if you're curious, am I allocating a much higher amount, lower amount, more distributions? This is a great kind of way to kind of check in with the community and see how others are doing it. So to the question of how to see other allocates, Absolutely. this would be it. And last, hey, hey, can, can please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. One other way to take advantage of this is actually, if you can do this live, just go to allocator.tech. And from the main page, you can you can see what's going on across allocators in terms of, you know, uh, who's been applying. And you can see all the information on that on that front end once this loads for you there. I think that's another way that's also easy as well to just get a sense of what's going on, who's who's working on different um, projects and what. That load. Thanks for adding that, Casey. Very much appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Right. Hey, and last is the question, hey, I'm a new allocator. How am I going to see data cap requests? So if you were a notary in the third or fourth rounds, the screenshot that I have up should be very familiar. This was the fill plus storage page. And this is where we were directing individuals to, hey, do you want to apply fill out the amount, and then you'll see a list of allocators. Right now, this site is not linked, which means that if an applicant wants to request data cap and work with you, 
they will need to come to your individual GitHub repository and apply there. So on the call later, we have time scheduled for a live walkthrough. And if KZ feels comfortable, Fiddle did a great job of making their own template. What you can do is just copy Fiddle's template, really low lift, and just paste it in your own repository and say, hey, if you'd like us to be the allocator for you, answer these questions and tell us about your data and we'll, we'll set you up. Some of the applicants may be looking to promote their ideas. So in the last governance call, we had individuals come and share their project. There's also a Slack called Allocator Review where these individuals can say, hey, I'm this org and I wanna have a look. But the big takeaways from this is the Fill Plus storage site is not live right now. Data applications will need to go directly to your GitHub repository and they'll need to fill out the form for the bookkeeping to go through it. I'll pause and see if anybody has any questions on those or if you wanna add anything before we hand it over to KZ. Wonderful. KZ, did you wanna talk about this one? Sure, actually we covered this a little bit earlier. So if something changes with GitHub users, you have the wrong GitHub username, Again, you need to go to your JSON file for your allocator. Scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the list of names or name. And if you need it updated, you can you can submit a new issue and Galen can, can help you there. Okay, F1 users. This is a little tricky. We'll just talk through um, essentially two scenarios. When you created an allocator, you were asked to submit a multi-sig. This is assuming you're, you're using the, the manual allocator process. The majority of us are, right? So you, you would need to have an F2 address for your multi-sig and either create that yourself and, and you gave that to Galen and K-Ray or you asked the governance team to create a multi-sig for you. So this is the case where if something changes, you, you wanna add a different cider to your multi-sig. Um, we were talking about earlier you know, th there was issues with people being able to sign with certain addresses. So if, if you've created your own multi-sig, then you probably already understand this, but the easiest way to do it is through the Glyph website. You can go, click on the multi-sig link, and you can add addresses to a, to a multi-sig that you've created. If Now, Galen, I'll let you jump in here, because if you created the multi-sig for them, you have to edit the, the addresses. Is that correct? Um, if I created the multi sig, no, if their signer is on, it, they on it. have control to change it. Yes. So and they, they can, if, someone if that's they a want signer... to. Sorry. If they want to, they can remove me if they want. I'm fine with that. But if you do, I won't be able to like make changes for you to that multi sig. So the, the power of choice is, is yours. Um, and I like, yeah. I won't be sending any data cap out on your behalf. Um, but if there is like an admin need that you need to change an address, that is still possible. But do not ask me because it will never happen. I will not send any data cap allocations from any of these multi-sigs like on behalf of somebody. If you say, I have a message, I have an error, I really need this client to get it. Can you just do it? The answer will always be no. It's not going to happen. But you can keep me on the multi-sig. Um, for administration of that multi-sig address if necessary. But you also, if your address is on that multi-sig, you can add other signers to it. You can also change the threshold um, and you can do that with the Glyph front end or you could do that um, through a Lotus, um, Lotus node as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to create a quick one pager um, this week that has a couple snapshots on how to add and address to a multi-sig. So that way people can start to do it on their own. It's not that hard. It, it, you just have to follow a few key steps. Um, so that'll get you going there. What's next, KRA? Okay, how do I add in an application after it's been created? This one is uh, very important for several reasons. For, for those of you that are from the LDN days, either as a notary or as a client, um, you would go open an application, came a new issue. And within that issue template, you could go and edit information. Let's say you typed in the wrong uh, information about the data set, or you needed to edit the amount for weekly allocation. You could go in and edit directly in the issue. 
this process has changed. So for those of you that are going into issues and editing, it is possible to edit, but it doesn't change anything um, in terms of allocations and those types of things. The way to do that is essentially following the guide that, that Will have created. But we, we can do a live walkthrough um, if you want KRA, if you want to do it, or if you want me to drive. Yeah, Casey. I'm happy to give a couple additional points of color here. Editing the issue will affect subsequent allocations, but not the active one. So the split that has happened now is that the the active conversation about you know this allocation of data cap to a client, the one that's sort of under consideration that you as an allocator might be signing, that individual slightly more atomic action is been moved to a pull request as the place where that conversation happens. The overall life cycle of a client asking for data cap for a data set still lives in the issue. So if you change the parameters in the issue, then in a week or in the time when the client runs out of data cap and needs a refresher, that next conversation pull request will be seeded from the issue. And likewise, if you have a client who's asked for data cap to an address that means that no pull request is opened because for instance, they've set their client address to one that's already under consideration and then later change it. You can regenerate the pull request from the issue in order to sort of move forward to have that atomic conversation. So there's different life cycles of these two things. And that sort of gives you a mental model of where you should be editing. I think that's probably those two conversations. To kind of show this, KZ, I could do this here or you could share screen. What would be your preference with a couple of minutes? Sure, we sure. We'll, we'll, we'll just talk through your screen here. So um, like, for example, th this is from my allocator repo. Okay, Ray, if you go to issues, just to show them. So if someone opens an application, you'll see it in the list of issues, right? So we have one of our clients, it's called Web3i. This one's a test one. You can skip this one. Scroll back for a second. Uh, yeah, Web3i applied to our allocator. They're asking for some data cap. So if I need to make a change to, for example, um, the weekly amount or any of the information related to their first allocation, here, okay, if you scroll up, again, I would go to pull request. I would find that specific client's pull request because you can see there's multiple. <clears throat> and then within here, you need to go to the actual JSON file. So you, okay, you, you click on files changed. There's a tab, the fourth one over next to conversations. Then you have commits, checks, files changed. Yep. So within here is the information that uh, the client entered in a format that's readable. This is where you would need to edit the specific information that you want to change. And the way to do that is you click on the three um, dots all the way on the right there, K-Ray. Down a little bit. Yep, yep. And you would you would click edit. I think I've already edited this file. So, but you would click edit file. You would go in, change the information you need to change specifically, and then hit the commit button. And you would um, be able to make that change. Again, th these steps are all mapped out in, in the, the guide that we'll put together a little bit better. But just to give you a live view that, so you understand when, when someone creates an application, it turns into an issue. But within the issue, there's also a pull request created each time there's an allocation. So if you need to make any changes, you would do that here. Um, re regarding the larger issue that was happening late last week that we flagged, where people were allocating large amounts of data cap, you can edit it that way. We're also changing the view on allocator.tech so that you can change the amount of data cap you want to allocate to your clients directly here. So this will be something we'll be releasing soon. So you'll have that information, but um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have to go into a pull request very often if that's just what you need to manage is, is the allocation amounts. We want you to be able to do that on allocator.tech. Um, it'll be much easier for you there.
this feels like a lot of uh, this, yeah go this ahead. is this is basically part two of the previous question you would go to the specific item that you wanted to edit and you could you could change it there based on the process we just described the the update you were describing Casey where on allocator.tech you can offer a different amount is already live um, if you use allocator.tech now you'll see um, that you have an option to choose whether to give a fixed amount or a manual amount uh, in addition to um, giving the amount that is set as the default weekly allocation. And this question was something we've covered earlier as well. If there's generally, if, you, if you're having an issue with signing something, go back to your original registry JSON, check your information there. If it's not listed in there correctly, you're not gonna be able to sign uh, or see your clients, all of those types of things. Got it. So we had this slide dedicated for the walkthrough that we just kind of took it on to kind of summarize the number one thing that we're seeing is individuals have changes to their JSON files. So again, if you feel comfortable finding your JSON file, just search your name and you'll see it here in the allocator registry. Then you could modify that and submit this. If for any reason you'd like the governance team to come through here, just make an issue like these, we'll close them out and we could take care of that for you. So it just depends on your comfortability level. If you'd like to edit your allocator JSON file yourself, please feel they empowered. Can't, Harry, they, they can't. Oh, they can't. Sorry, they, they can't edit the file. These files are these files are locked. They can I mean, propose. They can they can they can make a pull request. Yeah. We'll just put okay. that in for you. Yeah. Sometimes this is helpful, just speaking from experience, when we're copying address IDs, when we're copying GitHub handles, it's very specific. So again, you could submit the pull request and we'll put that in. Or again, feel free to make an issue. And that's why you have a friendly team of Galen and myself to come back and back you up. So we have five minutes left on the call. I'd like to turn it over for anything that might have come up in your world or anything that's on your mind. The open forum floor is yours. Well, hello, welcome to the second allocator governance call taking place on April 2nd, 2024. On this agenda, most of the topics revolve around troubleshooting issues and FAQ involved with setting up the onboard and getting your first data cap allocations out the door. So to check in on what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna first start by going over, hey, everyone should have their data cap distributions, making sure that's correct. Then we'll talk about some of the ways that you could file a support ticket and look for help, both from Fiddle and the governance team and walk you through that step. Then we're gonna check in on weekly distribution schedules. There's a little bit of a difference between the tooling of an application and the data cap that will go out. So just making sure everyone's aware of that and how to monitor those weekly distributions to align. Then we'll check in on tooling. What is the Fiddle team up to that should make this process easier for you? In terms of FAQ, we've been pulling all of the comms from Slack and GitHub, putting them in one place. So we're going to bulk answer a lot of the issues that have come up over the last two weeks and let you know where we can get you the fastest help possible. Then, as always, there'll be time at the end for anything that's on your mind. Feel free to drop a question in chat and we'll get to you as we go forward. I'm hearing no sound. Galen, am I not coming through okay, or am I coming through okay? You're coming through. All right. Hey, Young, if there's an issue, let me know. Otherwise, we can uh, capture it on the flip side for you to get you all squared away. All right, with that, hello. Next call is going to be taking place on April 16th because today is April 2nd. So look for that. We have the link, as always, in the slide deck. And the slide deck, as always, is posted in the Phil Plus channel as well as the Allocator channel. Everybody got their data cap. So if you check out the data cap stats page, you'll see a list of all the allocators that are listed, along with the data cap allocated, as well as the amount of data cap that went out the door. So this link is in the slide deck if you don't have access to it. But again, just letting you know, data cap should be waiting for you. So let's check in on support and the best way to kind of get you set up. To check in, there are two ways that you can get support issues handled. Issue number one is in Slack. And in Slack, we have the private channel. It's only for allocators, and it's meant to solve technical issues related to allocators. So Phil Plus channel is still for broad communication, program oversights, FIPS, discussion. 
the allocator channel is just tactical things to make the process simpler for you as allocators. The second is that there is an allocator registry in GitHub. So if you haven't seen it before, we'll talk a lot about it on the call and make sure that you know how to work both of these systems. So for Slack, I want to kind of flag two things. The first is that we recommend you use Slack in the public channel, the allocator channel, versus DMing KZ or DMing Will or DMing me or DMing Galen. And the reason for that is there's a lot of moving pieces with some of these questions that you have. So if the communication gets locked into one of us, it can really slow down the support that we give you. So if you send a message in the allocator channel, hey, I have this problem, all of us see it. And since we span many time zones, it's a lot faster to get you what you need. So the point of this one is as much as possible, if you avoid DMs, unless they're private information and use that channel, you'll see a much more rapid response for support and issues. And the second is with GitHub, it makes it a lot more automated in how you're getting support. So if Slack, you might have a chain of conversations and it gets moved down the line after a lot more conversations happen. What's nice about GitHub is it's always at the top right there. So on this call, we're gonna talk about GitHub and how to use that as a support mechanism and go through it as well as check in. So if you haven't yet seen the allocator registry in GitHub, we'll talk about that on this call. And the last thing is for support is you don't need to stand by and wait for a member of Fiddle or the governance team, because we're gonna show you how this process works on the back end. So if you're technically minded and you wanna update your own JSON information, We'll talk a lot about that on this call. So three ways for support, message us in Slack, avoid DMs, ping us on allocator registry in GitHub, we'll rapidly get back to you, or we'll teach you how to fish and fix your own issue with JSON as we go forward. And the goal of all this work is that in the coming days and weeks, what you'll see is when you come into GitHub, specific templates that allow you to specifically request issues. My GitHub isn't working. I haven't seen a signature on this data cap. My multi-sig address has changed. Fill in the blank. We'll have a template that you could fill out and make that process as simple as possible to get you going. So let's take a look at tooling that's coming from the Fiddle Lab that will make this process simple. With this, I'm just going to scan to see if anybody from Fiddle's on the phone. It doesn't look like it. So I will talk to this and uh, I'll link you the recording for everything that they said in the morning session. So essentially, Fiddle is made up of Marta, KZ, and Will. And what they're working on is tooling to benefit the allocator program specific to you guys, the allocators. So they have a repo. It's called Fiddle Labs Allocator Tooling. You'll see the link here in the slide deck. And when you open this up, essentially what they're going to have is all of the issues that they're working. So we're going to try to update you on this on every governance call, as well as on Fridays. And essentially what all of these issues boil down to this week are looking at bot enhancements and primarily how a wallet will sign and that specific wallet has access. So as these processes come on board, they're gonna be snowballing and water falling down. So if you have an issue that you wanna bump up, please leave a comment. Fat man, I already see you writing in chat that you wanna bump up that issue 21. Probably the best way is to leave that comment in that issue 21 as you come through here. And then we can make that. And we'll talk about the, yeah, that's a big one, the capitalization of the GitHub usernames. And they specifically mentioned that in the call, that that's going to be coming down the pipe, if not this week, next week. So good stuff. Talking about support, we've realized that documentation on Phil Plus could stand to be better. And one thing that makes it challenging is just how quickly everything changes. So in this slide deck, you're going to see two links, and I'm going to drop these in the Slack channel for the allocator because these are really helpful links as well. Link number one was put together by Will Scott at Phil, Fiddle Labs. And what you see with this is essentially everything you need to do in order to edit an application JSON file. And why this is important is this will be the mechanism that you use to update GitHub names, to change your weekly allocation schedule and pull requests, to update your multi-sig address. So what this was set up is to be a step-by-step -step guide as you go through it, and it will show you that process. And on this call, we're gonna talk about that process as well. The second link that might be helpful for you is an FAQ. What's nice about this FAQ is as of February, so it's still very, very current, 
And it goes through a lot of the common questions we've seen come through either on Slack, when we were meeting with you guys in person at some of the conferences, or that have come up on these calls. So everything from like, when do is an audit trigger to how does the impact of data cap allocated have impact on the schedule? Lots of great questions that have come up. And what we're going to try to do is when these questions come up in Slack, give you an answer and then also link back to this doc to make those questions better and more streamlined as it goes forward. So again, these two resources are really helpful. They're here in the slide deck. I'll put them in chat for you to go through. And last is one thing that's nice about GitHub is it seems to be a source of truth as we move through in this file plus program. So what we're trying to do is take a lot of these FAQs that might come in, say, a Word doc or this separate page and try to put them in one place for you as well. So this work in progress will have in GitHub some of these questions that we've seen, how to change the address in GitHub, whatever it may be, listed like an FAQ. So it makes it a little bit easier for a newer allocator to come on board, which is why we really appreciate the questions, because we take those questions, we help you through it ideally, and then we can make sure that we put that in a guide for other people to see. So look for this coming in the coming days and weeks. Next, we're going to talk about the weekly allocation schedule and how this is really kind of impacting you and what you should be aware of. So feel free to jump in, anybody on the line, Galen, anyone else. I'll just kind of keep going. And if there's anything that we want to kind of catch on, happy to just circle into it. Here's what's going on with the weekly allocation schedule. So if an application comes through, there's currently no tooling that will set the data cap distribution rate which means if an applicant asks for a large amount of data all at once, the tooling will not prevent that data from going out all at once. So what that means is it's the responsibility of the allocators to ensure that the right amount of data cap is going out per the schedule that you listed here. So this came up, KZ posted an issue in Slack around last week saying that we've seen some allocators that have had vast large sums of data cap go out in their first tranche. And that shouldn't be the case. So let's take a look at why that shouldn't be the case and what we should be doing going forward to make sure that that doesn't happen. So if you look at these two screenshots that are on the screen right now, the first question right here comes from the data cap allocation strategy, question number 30 in the allocator application. And that question asks, what is your tranche schedule to clients? So everyone will spell out how much of a percentage they'll give as it goes forward. But none of those applications would say 100% in round one. So that means that if an application is received to you as an allocator and you're letting 100% go out, that shouldn't be the case. So let's talk about how to change that. What you'll need to do is this second screenshot here. If you have an application that comes through you need to adjust or manually change the pull request to make sure that the weekly allocation for that data cap distribution matches the allocation schedule you put in question 30. So if someone was requesting, I don't know, let's just say 500 terabytes, and you see this weekly allocation of 50 terabytes, well, that'll be 10%, the first 10% that would go out. And then after the next tranche, you would edit the pull request. Now we realize that this is a manual process. So thank you for your patience with that. The tooling will be on board in about a week or two on the allocators.tech page that will let you specify how that goes through. But right now you need to adjust these pull requests to ensure that the allocation tranches are aligning. I'll kind of pause since I see a hand. Galen, floor is yours, bud. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, reiterate or, or double click on this. We um, saw like we said we saw a couple of these allocations go out that are much larger than um even what the allocator expected to do um we've already seen like a removal request from some of the allocators saying i did not mean to give this much data cap um to one client who was a new client this is what the tooling showed me so i just hit approve um and that is a problem uh, that also sort of indicates but the, the tooling is supposed to be supporting you performing the diligence. But again, the burden of checking these things um, falls to each allocator. Uh, and so as you are looking at these client applications, the burden of, is this the right amount? 
is this a new client? Is this um, the right thing that I want to approve? <laughs> because when the governance team goes to do those compliance audits to see should each allocator pathway get another tranche of data cap, we're going to be looking at all of the allocations that you have made. Um, and so if a mistake happens and you catch it right away and you document that and you take steps to correct it, um, that is going to be significantly better uh, and work in your favor rather than the governance team finding this and needing to go chase down, well, what's the explanation? Why did you, know, why did you give um, one PIB of data cap as a first allocation? So check these things, open, these, open the bugs for us. And yes, there is a um, manual way. Additionally, we want to be updating um, the sort of allocator JSON file. This is the one that has, you know, what is your application number? What is your address? What is your information? We're going to be adding in some hard-coded sort of tranche schedules for each pathway. Um, but as you can imagine, these were sort of everyone entered plain text information on their application saying, you know, I'll give out five TIBs or my firstborn or, you know, 100% of their weekly amount, whichever is worth less money. And like, that is a very hard thing for us to then translate into a code um, or into a calculation. So we're going to figure out an easy way to do that. It's probably going to involve, um, you know, people submitting a PR um, to edit what their allocation tranche schedule is. Another thing that came up is this question of if somebody has been in the ecosystem and worked with the LDN process, are they an initial client? Like, are they a new client to me? My understanding, my interpretation of this is yes. If your application to be an allocator said, I will give out 50 TIBs of initial allocation to a new client um, or 10% of their you know, weekly amount for a second allocation, I will give 100 TIBs for a third, et cetera. If someone comes and they apply and they say, I have been working with the LDN process, here is my history, send me data cap. Um, two things, thing number one, like that is a new relationship between you as an allocator and your address, um, this multi-sig address and this client. So that should be an initial allocation amount. You can take that history and use that to inform your future diligence. Um, you can use that to say, like, this person has already provided this information. I can have confidence in them, but it is still an initial allocation. And thing two, we want clients to be using new addresses. So if a client comes to you and says, I have an address, um, and it's this existing address that has made these deals and received these um, tranches of data cap from the LDN multisig, that is going to have an impact on the tooling and potentially lead to problems for you down the line when audits need to happen, when we need to verify, um, when subsequent allocations need to be kicked off, because the bots are going to look at all of the data cap history from the client address. And it is going to, there is no way on chain right now for us to partition from a client if they receive data cap from multiple addresses and then they go to deals with multiple storage providers, there's no way for the client to say, well, the data cap that I got from this notary address, I'm going to use that in this deal over here with this storage provider, but the data cap I got from this allocator multi-sig, I'm going to use that in this other deal. The chain just sees it as first in, first out. And so where that can be a problem is if a client uses the same address and goes and applies to, you know, one allocator pathway that says we are only going to work with public open data and we're going to require three different copies. And then they go and apply to another one with another data set, but they use the same client address. And that other allocator says, you know, we only require, you know, two copies. The bot is not going to be able to parse from that one client address what the deals to these SPs would relate back to those allocators. So clients should be using a new address. And where this can become a problem is if a client shows up to you and claims to be 
you know, oh, I, I'm a representative of this LDN project over here that has a great history, but here's my new client address. You should question whether or not that is accurate. Have them send you a message from their old client address to verify that they still have ownership of that old client address. Because anyone could claim, anyone could go through the backlog of LDNs or go look at, you know, used client addresses and say, oh, yes, this was me, but I don't have access to that wallet anymore. But you can trust that that is me. You know, this, the whole point of this system is that it is uh, there is some amount of trust but verify uh, proofing that happens. And so you can just ask them to verify by sending a message from that old address or some other means of diligence verification. But regardless, clients should be using new addresses with allocators. Um, they should be using unique client addresses for different data set projects. And you as an allocator should be following your allocation tranche schedule to all of these clients, making manual overrides when necessary to say this person claimed they would use one PIB a week. That is more than I am comfortable giving a new client. My stated allocation schedule was 50 TIBs. I have adjusted it appropriately. Okay, Ray, back to you. Yeah, we'll start, Galen. Thanks. So let's talk about some of the issues in the form of an FAQ. I'm going to have about 10 slides. I'm going to walk through, and these are some of the questions that have come up recently. So let's dig into what's come up. Number one is people have messaged in DMs, hey, I've got this issue. What's the status? Where, where can I get an update on it? So here's what I recommend. Going forward, if we get a DM, I might say, like, I'm so sorry. Let me help. And I'm probably going to direct you to GitHub, to this fill project allocator registry page. And here, when you make a new issue, you can then say what the issue is that's impacting. This way, anybody that's running support can make sure that we step in and get you what you need versus a DM where it might be a weekend or someone's out of the office, then you're having to wait a little bit of a longer time needlessly. So we're going to post this into Slack, but essentially to form a support issue, all you have to do is just make a new issue. Hey, I, my GitHub won't get me in. I need a new user added to the JSON, whatever it is. You could post it here and this lets all of us support you. So the allocator registry is a great place. We'll pin this in Slack. The second question that I saw over the last couple of days is, hey, how do I know if the data cap's actually gotten to me and how can I see what other people have? Real easy answer is if you go to data cap stats, this page has everything that's listed on the data cap, where it's come from, where it's gone out. And the third was, I know that I have data cap, but how do I see other allocators? How much are they allocating? Am I in the min, the max, the medium? So if you go to that data cap stats, you'll notice that everybody has a notary or an allocator ID. If you copy that ID and take it to Phil Fox and paste it, you can now see everybody else's data that's taking place. So this is a great way to kind of say, am I doing too much, too little? Am I right in the mean? What are other peers doing? That's how you would do it. I'm going to post this as well. The fourth was, hey, now that we have this new allocator process, how are people coming to get data cap from me? So a little bit of a longer answer that's pretty simple to start is before we used to have this fill plus storage dot apply. And if you've been around the community for a while, this was a great page where individuals could come, enter their data, their background information, then match with an allocator. We're working on updating this tooling. So in the meantime, all data applications should be coming directly to your GitHub, which means if you were Fiddle Labs and somebody wanted data cap, you should direct them to your application project in your GitHub repo or whatever mechanism you have set up. They apply for the data cap and they enter how they're gonna be doing it. And then you have that issue in GitHub that will tie back to the allocator.tech. If you just want to put yourself out there like a jellyfish and just see what comes and you want to see what else is out there, there is a Slack channel and the link is right here. And this is application review. If you've been around for a while, you might've seen this. And these are people that have submitted applications or don't know where to submit their applications and they want to match with an allocator. So it's a great place if you're looking for either large or smaller data sets, but to come back Essentially, all data cap will need to be directed to the GitHub page that you have set up for those new applications. 
This is probably the most common one that I've seen. And so to kind of update what's going on, this question is, hey, I cannot do anything in GitHub. I can't sign it. I can't see it. I'm having an issue with the GitHub and the repos that I have. Here's why. When we set this up last quarters in Q3 and Q4 of 2023, a lot of work went into moving the model over to a JSON format. And if you come into the repository allocator registry where we talked about support issues, you'll see that all allocators are categorized by their JSON file. And this number that you see is just the number that came from your allocator application. So what happens when you cannot see GitHub, it's because the GitHub user that was provided is different than the GitHub user that you're trying to log in on. And so you cannot action your application under a GitHub profile that is not a GitHub profile list in this. So you have two solutions. Solution number one is you can make an issue for support and I'll come through and I'll help get you set up. So in that issues, you can see here, you can make a new one and say, hey, I would like to add a name or I can't do anything on it. Later on in the call, I'll show you the steps to actually modify this JSON file yourself and then submit it as a request and then we'll commit it to the main branch. But again, if you're having issues with GitHub, it's because the GitHub username is not the same one that's linked to your JSON file. I'll show you how to correct that. We've also seen this one a few times. It's like, hey, how do I add new F1 users to an existing multi-sig? Two parts. If you set your multi-sig up using Glyph, you will be the controller of this. So if you go to Glyph and you come to multi-sig and you've connected your wallet, you'll then see the ability to update and add new multi-sigs and F1 users to that multi-sig. So if you set this up yourself, you should be really empowered on how to add those F1 addresses. If a member of the Filecoin Foundation or Galen set that up for you, this will require us to manually add that signer. And since you had Foundation set that up, again, what you would do is come back and make a new issue, and then we will set that up for you. Galen, I see your hand, floor is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add to this. If you set up a multi-sig, um, or if I set up a multi-sig for you and put an address on there for you, and you have signing rights from that address, you just need to add another one, you can do that yourself. You can also remove me from your multi-sig. Um, that is fine. You can also change the threshold of your multi-sig um, and increase it if you are going to require two signers um, for every data cap allocation. I, you know, I would suggest not doing that for now uh, because it will, will double the amount of signatures you'll need at this point. Um, I will never send data cap allocations from many of these multi-sigs. Uh, I'm only going to be on there if someone needs to manage and edit the addresses that, I'm, that are on them. So if you run into a problem and you say, oh, we have this client we really need uh, to get them data cap, but there's a problem with our address or our ledger, can you just approve this data cap? The answer will always be no. So don't even bother asking me. I will not do it. The only reason I am on those multi-sigs is from an administrative standpoint of being able to add more addresses to them. Um, Hopefully, as we you know move down the line and, and get better with smart contracts, parts of this will will go away because we'll have um, we'll set these things up as different kind of structures where we can just say, here's one big pathway um, allocation, and all the different people can allocate out of it. Um, but for now, each F two should only have at this point probably two addresses on it. Feel free to add trusted addresses that you know. Um, but you will also need to update the JSON file um, as you add those addresses. So if you go and you just go onto the chain and manually add an address, um, you will also need to open an issue, um, as Kay was mentioning, in the allocator registry JSON file. Because again, all the tooling is looking back and forth at both on-chain who is on the multi-sig to be able to send things, but also what are the different signers um, and there, so there is a section on there of the MSIG as well as a section for the different signers. And that's like, um, it's a very, right now it's the very last line on the uh, JSON file. So edit your own multi-SIGs as you need um, and open issues uh, to keep us updated. Nice, nice. 
So this one's come through and the question is, how do I edit an application after it's been created? So essentially you, we used to see the applications as the sources of truth in the third and fourth rounds. What's different about every allocator being their own branch is that now the applications are no longer the source of truth as they go through it, which means after you edit an application to do that, you actually have to come into the pull request to do it. So let me show you what this looks like here. So right now I'm using the example from Fiddle Labs and they had two applications that have come through and you could see it right here with this web 3 EI. And this applicant had filled out all the data that Fiddle Labs had asked for in the application. Who are you? What are you doing with the data? How will you back it up? All the same common stuff that came through. Now. If there ever needs to be a modification in this one, they, you or anybody can come to the pull request and then you see the data cap for Web3 EI. And if you need to modify this, this would be the steps that you do it. So now you can come through here and see like, hey, I wanna validate the pull request or any of the information. And now you can edit this to make sure that it lines up specifically with what should be going out the door. So again, we'll put these guides out there, but to edit your application after it's been created, come back to the pull request and submit a branch that way. And as always, if you need backup on this one, the perfect way to do it is to come over here to the allocator issues registry and submit an issue. And then myself or Galen or any member of the fiddle team will be happy to help you as you go through all. Editing an allocation amount. So this came up earlier in the call and a good example was somebody requested 500 terabytes and you don't want it to go out all in one distribution. To do that, you're gonna have to modify the allocation schedule that goes out. So let me show you what that modification looks like. You're gonna need to, again, edit the pull request. So if I come into this application right here that I've been looking at, if I grab one of these and now I can edit the details, what I want to do is I want to make sure that everything in this can be all set up. So if I come to files change on my application, I can see that right now the weekly allocation set up for this is 50 terabytes. Now, if I was using the tranche schedule that I've outlined in my application as an allocator and I wanted to match it, here's where I would come through and put it in. Galen, I'll pause because I see your hand. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry. I just uh, I have to drop. So apologize if there are some other questions or things that come up. Um, I know we got a lot of really good Q&A in the first call, so check that recording um, and then capture the questions that we have, uh, open issues, put them in Slack, and hopefully we keep getting all these things addressed and everyone across the finish line. So thanks, everybody. So when you come into Files Changed, you can now see the weekly allocation schedule. So this might be be set for something big, like 500 terabytes, a petabyte, whatever it may be. But if you click on these three dots, you can now come through and edit. If for any reason you cannot edit these applications, that's because the GitHub name is off and we'll need to change that in your JSON file. I'll show you how that step works shortly. So let me show you the last part, which would be doing any of these steps yourself if you don't want to file an issue. So in the allocator registry, if you come back to the code base, you'll see that there's a file location for allocators themselves. And in this list is all of you, all of the allocators that are here in the program. And again, these numbers correlate to your application that was filed. So if you're not sure which application number you are, you can just run a quick search here and then pull up your name, and then that'd be the best way to find your name on the list. Or if you just happen to know it, you can go ahead and click it. When you open up one of these, you'll see all of the information that pulled from your application that we use for the tooling, the address, the name, the location, as well as your allocating bookkeeping path. So one of the first questions we got was, hey, what's my bookkeeping path or I wanna change it? So if you let us know, what we do is we come back here and we change and verify this. So if you wanted to do this yourself, just come into your JSON file here. You can click to edit, come being down, update this code and then submit a branch. And then we'll just approve it and just say, hey, I changed my allocation bookkeeping repo. The same thing with your GitHub. So if you found that you're unable to adjust your GitHub on your repo, it might be because the GitHub username is not the same one. Feel free to edit this yourself and submit it or 
send an issue to us and we'll be happy to help. And the last thing is the signer. So if your F1 address isn't coming up, let us know, or you can come through and just manually add that F1 address and get going on that. I'm seeing two questions in chat. So I'll kind of pause here and hit those questions. First, Fatman13, thanks for the question. It's, if the weekly allocation is 50 terabytes, how much data cap am I granting to each client every time I approve on the dashboard? Are you talking about the dashboard, the allocator.tech or a different dashboard, Fatman, just so I know how to get you the best? While you answer that, I'll go on to Doris's. How do we add it to bookkeeping? All right, well, I'm gonna pause on that one, Doris. Ah, Batman, you're quick. Yes, this number should be edited. Not yet. I talked with Will this morning and the process is gonna be done this week, ideally. So you can specify here in allocator.tech what you wanna be for the data cap to approve. So rather than having to come into that really long convoluted process of like manually updating this every tranche, in the next couple of days, you'll be able to do that directly here on the allocator tech. If not, let me know. And then obviously Will is prioritizing this as he goes through. Thanks, good question. Doris, your question was, how do we edit the bookkeeping? Good question as well. So when we set up everyone's allocator pathways, either we ask you to create this yourself, or if you were keen, Galen or myself went through and set these up for you. If for any reason, you need a new pathway for your bookkeeping, the best way to do it would be to probably just submit an issue here in the allocator registry, like, hey, I need a new allocator pathway for bookkeeping, but please be specific. What was the old one? Why is it no good? And why do you wanna to go to the new one? And the second is if for any reason you cannot edit your bookkeeping registry, that's because we don't have your GitHub information correct in your JSON file. So to either manually edit yourself or let us know. Doris, if that hit your question, let me know. If there's anything more I can provide, please let me know. Just to make sure I get you what you need. So again, for a live walkthrough, the biggest one is in the allocator registry, this is where all of your information lives. So I know that 99% of you are far more technical than I ever hoped to be or dreamed to be. So you could edit these with like one eye open. If you come into the JSON file, make sure that your GitHub user is correct. All of the information is right here. Like just picking this one, it looks like SSX, we might have an issue with you being able to sign because it looks like your GitHub user is an actual website. So anything like this, please let us know. We don't have tooling to catch this. So unless you let us know, we can't fix anything that might be blocking you. So with that, I'll pause. I'll open up the floor for anything that you'd like to dig into or discuss. The floor is yours. Seeing no questions, I'm going to follow up with Doris. Doris, you just posted your issue number, 1044. Let's take a look at what's going on. So when I come in here, I see that your allocation bookkeeping is github.com A911car. I'm gonna guess that this issue is giving you a little bit of complications because it's not branched off anything. And what I mean by that is, let me pull up a different application number that's all set up and you can see the difference. And then I'll show you how to modify this one here. It looks like we've already got the issue. So I'll follow up after the call to show you how I've done this. So if I pull up an example here, like 996, who I like to call out, you see how they have their GitHub, their organization, then they have their open data pathway. What's nice about this one is that's their repo for their allocating the bookkeeping. And if you see some of the other ones that we have, they have the Phil Plus bookkeeping, Flamenco. Bad one here. GitHub, Phil Plus bookkeeping, power organization. What I'm going to do for you and yours is I'm going to make sure that you have a bookkeeping repo that stood up and then you have all of your other things. I think the issue that might be coming is just this one set branch off the main is preventing you from going forward. So thanks for flagging it. Thanks for filing that ticket. And then we'll get you all set up to have this allocation bookkeeping. Doris, if there's anything that comes up afterwards, the best, fastest way to get you set up is avoid DMing me directly and message in the allocator channel. Sometimes I'm out of the office for medical or whatever it may be. 
this is the best way in that allocator. That way, KZ and Galen can also help. But we'll get this all set up and get you squared away. If there's anything wrong, let me know in Slack. Hume, I'm seeing your question. Let me take a look here. Except maybe 10 allocators. I still do not receive data cap for allocator. When will we allocate it? Hume, I think you're in the boat that we didn't get your information by the deadline that we had last Friday. Thanks for bearing with us. Right now, we're just waiting on the second root key holder signature. By design, it's meant to be decentralized. So just when they're available to sign it, we'll get that set up. I would imagine if you don't see that in the next day or so, or you will see that. I'll just phrase it like that. I imagine that you'll see that data cap in the next day or so. Thanks for your patience, and you'll be all set going forward. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. I'll post these videos to YouTube and put the slides in chat. If there's anything that comes up, I think the hope that I have for you as a takeaway is feel free to come through here and come and submit your issue in GitHub, or please just message us in the Slack, and we'll be happy to follow up with everyone else. Thank you again for your time, your service. I wish you all the best. Cheers, everyone.